फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड मॉर्निंग बिकॉज वी हैव पार्टिसिपेंट फ्रॉम डिफरेंट प्लेसेस डिस्टिंग्विश स्पीकर एंड पार्टिसिपेंट्स I, Dr. Gayatri Vishkarma, am pleased to welcome you to the day two program of JCOD on elite reviewer training. Reviewing is a time-intensive process and an accountable job. So, on day one, we learned reviewing process and experiences from stalwarts. The meeting started with the keynote address by Dr. Greg Schroeder, who brilliantly covered the various reviewing aspects and format to be followed as a reviewer. there were three interactive session followed by one interactive multiple choice question quiz activity which is well coordinated by all the moderators covering all important aspects like important of peer review identification of review roles and responsibility do you were ensures rigorous standards of scientific process upholds the integrity of the journal and also can help prevent ethical breaches everyone knows that the ultimate decision is always rest with the editor but reviewer plays a significant role in determining the outcome so here we are uh, we are here to discuss some of the important points such as reviewing different kinds of articles how to uh give uh, different types of comments on different articles writing the review reports especially the statistical and methodological concept so in this event we have a keynote speaker today dr michael felling in our webinar so let's welcome dr uh, michael felling who is giving the talk on expectations of an author from a reviewer so over to you dr chhabra who will introduce i am going to share the screen thank you gayatri in fact it is my pleasure and honor to yeah. be able to introduce one of the biggest stalwarts in the field of uh, spine surgery and spine management across the globe uh, professor michael felix professor michael felix is not only a great scholar he is a great supporter and a great friend as well he is a md phd fr frcsc and fcs he is a professor of neurosurgery and vice chairman research in the department of surgery co director university of toronto spine program and director neurosciences program university of toronto he has more than 1500 publications with 61206 citations and an h index of 121 friends isn't that phenomenal focus on, he focuses on preclinical and clinical translational research related to enhancing repair and regeneration of the injured central nervous system he is the harbor chair in neural repair and regeneration he is fellow royal society of canada and canadian academy of health sciences friends in fact i could go on and on and the webinar would be over if i were to do a thorough job of introducing professor michael felix but in the interest of science i'll request him to deliver his keynote address today thanks for joining us professor michael felix uh, it's my pleasure and uh, and an honor to uh, uh, to join you um i'll just take a moment to share my screen as well and i trust that you're able to see this the screen okay we can see you very well Uh, yeah, very good. So, well, it's it, it's an honor to uh, to deliver this lecture, and I've been asked to um, to discuss, um, you know, what is what is a good reviewer? What are the expectation of the authors? And I've taken a few different uh, perspectives uh, from this, and certainly the peer reviewer is is a critical element of this whole uh, a, a process in terms of maintaining uh, the integrity of the. Um, of the science that that we that we do so i have no relevant commercial disclose uh, conflicts to disclose um i do wish to acknowledge that i um in addition to my role as as an author i also i'm on the other side in terms of um serving on multiple editorial boards uh as previously a uh, chair of the editorial board of journal of neurosurgery spine and 
I'm currently a deputy editor on the journals that you see, and I'm a member of the editorial board of uh, a number of journals. This is a, a partial uh, list. And um, just a, a big shout out as well to Professor Chabra, the editor in chief of the Journal of Clinical Orthopedics and Trauma. And it's an honor for me also to be uh, associated with this important uh, journal. So let's begin. So what are the expectations of an excellent reviewer? What would I hope for as an author? Um, I think fairness is important and all of us have unconscious biases, but one needs to approach an article in as unbiased a fashion as possible. And if one does perceive significant conflicts of interest, it's better to pass this on. One should be constructive and thorough and also evidence-based. And so one needs to base any comments or criticisms um, on a thorough knowledge of the article and when appropriate to reference literature. And one should be knowledgeable. And if there are areas, um, for example, advanced statistical approaches that fall outside of one's area of uh, knowledge and expertise, this should be flagged to the editor. And on an occasion, uh, an external uh, expert review, say from a statistics perspective, will be required. And we're all very busy in our lives, professionally, personally, but when, when one uh, accepts a, um, a request to review, the expectation is that this be done in a timely fashion. And uh, most journals will expect a turnaround within about uh, two weeks, which I think is, is quite uh, fair. Of course, earlier is, is, um, is better, but one should avoid the situation where this goes on the back burner. So I realize that uh, Professor Schroeder will have uh, uh, spoken about a few of these points, but I think it's helpful to provide different perspectives. So <clears throat> in terms of the format of a review, um, as an author, um, I uh, take um, uh, great um, uh, importance in terms of the format of the review that the reviewer uh, takes, and this can be very helpful. So my expectation as an author would be that the reviewer has a good knowledge of the article. And so this is evidenced by providing a summary of the paper in the opening paragraph of the review. This should include the key points and a comment on the novelty impact and on the contribution to the field. So this gives the overarching summary. Then um, when the reviewer should provide an overarching perspective as to whether the paper meets the bar or does it require minor revision or major revision, or is the, the paper sufficiently flawed as to warrant rejection. And I think it's important that if you feel that an article is just not going to meet the bar, it's better to reject the article up front than to put the author through multiple rounds of revision, which I, I think does a disservice to the author as well. And in addition, it does not reflect well on the journal. So it's better if you don't like the article and you think it's flawed, it's better just to reject up front. You should summarize any major points of revision and you can put these in bullet format or numbered format, but this becomes very important because as I'll subsequently discuss in this lecture, the author will rely on this in the response and you should be objective and clear. So you shouldn't make statements like you don't like this or you don't like that. It should be very objective and evidence-based. And then you should distinguish any major points of revision from minor points, which might be stylistic points or, or minor errors or corrections. So the review of the manuscript presentation, in a sense, this is a bit of a partnership between the author and the reviewer. So I think the expectation of the reviewer from the author is that spelling and grammar should be checked. It is not the job of the reviewer to edit the paper, but one should flag issues. And sometimes these are of a very minor nature, 
But if, uh, if there is a major language issue, it should be flagged and the author can uh, uh, consult with um, uh, uh, English speaking uh, editors um, to assist with the, um, with, with the preparation of the manuscript. It's important that the authors adhere to the journal formatting. So each journal has its own format. Um, and so this um, reflects um, a number of points, the number and the type of figures and tables, the referencing, the abstract formatting. And is the manuscript formatting uh, consistent uh, throughout? Are the tables and figures clearly designed and then do they support the manuscript's contents? So, uh, an excellent table and figure should be readable on its own without extensive referencing back to the article. And the tables and the figures are very effective at conveying information. And as a reviewer, I pay a lot of attention uh, to these. Um, and so high quality tables and figures are a sign of an excellent article. Are the methods and statistics clearly framed? and describe to a level where the experiments could be reproduced. It's my expectation of a reviewer that the reviewer would have a basic knowledge of a fundamental statistical approaches, but it's not my expectation that a reviewer be an expert in advanced statistics methodology. And sometimes for challenging um, methodological approaches, um, a statistical consultation will be, will be required. But for the majority of articles submitted to a clinical journal, such as JCOT, this, this won't be required. But you should have a knowledge of when statistics are applied appropriately. So there's an element of storytelling when writing a manuscript. Have the authors done a good job of giving the background information to support why they chose to study the question? So it's not my expectation as an author that the reviewer is going to be an expert in my area. And so it's my job as an author to tell the story. Um, and then it's important that the um, author convey the message about how the research advances the field. And it's important that the, uh, that the editor and that the reviewer have a grasp of this. And this is one of the critical elements in the introduction uh, to, the, to the article. Is a manuscript presented in a logical manner where readers can read through in sequential order and understand the paradigm? And it's important for the author to convey this to the reviewer and for the reviewer to get this and to be able to uh, reflect um, this logic in the review or if the article is difficult to follow, then that needs to be conveyed. And sometimes articles are very difficult to follow. It's, it's hard to know what the message is. And it's not the job of the reviewer to struggle through the article to try to figure this out. But if the reviewer has the sense that, that this could be a worthwhile topic of discussion, but it needs a rewrite, then that can be pointed out. The discussion and conclusions accurately reflect the findings of, of, the, of the work. Um, are they objective? Um, and it's important that, um, that there be uh, an, an accurate and unbiased uh, reporting of the literature. So the way that the supporting literature um, is assessed um, is often a weakness in many articles. There, um, it's important that the authors provide an unbiased overview of the past research. And it's important that the reviewer look at the, uh, at the references, not necessarily look up every reference, but perhaps to look up a few selected references. It, it, this can, is one of the advantages of being a reviewer because it's a great way also to stay on top of your field and to learn. Are the references recent and relevant? Are they accurately placed? And so I often encounter situations where authors will make statements, but then the referencing for that statement is not relevant, it's inaccurate. And, and that, that is something that's very important that it be flagged. So I'll just spend a few minutes on this, uh, on this slide, which is an important slide. 
and the um, the uh, the website that you may wish to reference is listed here. So equatornetwork.org. Uh, and these are the reporting guidelines for main study types. So randomized uh, trials generally are uh, reported uh, consistent with consort guidelines, and there are specific checkpoints that need to be reported. Observational studies, which will include most of the types of um, research uh, presented in a clinical surgical journal, such as JCOT, should follow the strobe uh, of guidelines. Systematic reviews, which are in increasingly uh, being reported in the literature, should follow the PRISMA guidelines. Sometimes authors will report on a study protocol that should follow the SPIRIT guidelines. Occasionally, there are diagnostic or prognostic studies. So, for example, looking at the role of MRI in the management of spinal trauma, as an example. This should follow the STARD guidelines. Case reports also have um, um, a standard of, um, of presentation, and these are the CARE uh, guidelines. There is a value to case reports. Um, I always encourage authors to ra rather than submitting one case, if one has a smaller number of cases, then it's a small series. And I think that case reports should be associated with a rigorous review of the literature, ideally a systematic review to truly make an impact in the field. Clinical practice guidelines also have um, uh, reporting guidelines as follows the AGREE the tool. Qualitative research studies, uh, so for example, where uh, uh, authors will seek uh, the opinions of individuals with lived experience or, or patients. This also has a reporting guideline. These are the SRQR guidelines. There likely won't be a lot of um, animal preclinical research uh, published in JCOP, but just for your knowledge, there also are guidelines there that are uh, uh, starting to become invoked. And these are the ARRIVE uh, guidelines. We're seeing more and more quality improvement studies that are being reported and there are SQUIRE guidelines. And then in addition, economic evaluations have a separate guideline referred to the CHEERS uh, uh, guidelines. And so um, th this can actually be quite uh, helpful uh, in terms of um, uh, referencing. And you know, this may be something as well that the senior editors of JCOP may wish to use and to invoke. Now, um, papers are generally uh, rejected or revisions are requested. Um, minor revisions are generally straightforward. It's the paper where major revisions are required that can be a bit trickier and involve quite a bit of work. And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, how to review a revised paper. And again, present this both from the perspective of the author as well as the uh, reviewer. So a well-formatted response which addresses each point raised by the reviewer is key. And an approach to consider is what's been referred to as the CALM algorithm. So what is the CALM algorithm? And this is the, um, this is the uh, reference uh, uh, here, which is actually on the Elsevier website, how to respond to reviewer uh, 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 comments. So when responding to a decision letter, have the author stayed calm? So the C, comprehend. Did the authors read over the comments and take time to understand what the reviewers and editors have asked of them? So you see, this is why it is so critical for the reviewer to be very objective and quantitative and evidence-based in the response. The A, answer, amend, or advocate. Were the authors polite and objective in the responses? It's also important for the reviewer to be very polite and objective in the review. Did the authors use this as an opportunity to strengthen their paper? And so the expectation then also of the reviewer is that the reviewer is trying to help the author 
by being constructive, not nitpicky, but critical when it's appropriate to be critical. And occasionally there's a disagreement in views and that's okay. Um, sometimes the authors will disagree with the reviewer's point of view. Sometimes a reviewer may not have it perfect. It's not the expectation that the reviewer will always be perfect. Um, and then the reviewer should be open to um, assessing the, uh, the author's perspective and not be defensive if the uh, reviewer has um, uh, effectively ar um, argued their uh, uh, point. The L is list. So did the uh, authors list each reviewer's comment and address it separately in a concise manner? And so this is why it's very helpful in the review to number your major points. And it becomes easier to reference these. And it also becomes much easier to uh, review uh, the revised uh, submission. And the M is mindful. So making it easier for the editor and the reviewers. So where the authors organize with the revision and ensure that all files were properly uploaded, but it's also important for the reviewer to be organized in the approach. The authors include a cover letter, a response to the reviewer's letter, and a manuscript with track changes. And then as a reviewer, if an author provides all of these materials, it becomes actually quite straightforward to review a revised um, article. And then if an author has taken the time and the effort to respond to e each of these uh, uh, points, um, then the likelihood of my uh, responding favorably becomes quite high. So writing the response to the reviewer's uh, letter. So the, and then, you know, as a reviewer, then I will review this very uh, carefully. And it's important to, um, uh, to, to examine this, uh, this letter because this provides a guidepost in terms of assessing the article. So the author should make a list and number the comments consecutively. Each comment needs to have a response from the authors. The responses should be clearly defined. So you could, for example, uh, use different color or italicize or in some way differentiate the response from the reviewer's comment. For responses referencing text in the manuscript, one should include the page number and the line number of the text or copy and paste the text into the response letter. So, so the, the, the better defined this response letter is, the easier it will be for the reviewer to examine this. If supporting literature is cited in the response letter, then the references should be included in the list at the end of the uh, letter. And it's my expectation as a reviewer that this be uh, in, included. And it can be helpful on occasion to include supporting figures in the response letter instead of asking reviewers to find a figure in the manuscript, but at least this should be uh, clearly uh, defined. Now in the manuscript revision, the authors should use track changes or highlighting and bolding to indicate the changes in the revised manuscript. And then as a uh, reviewer, this will make your task uh, uh, easier. Now each journal, however, has its own style for how to indicate revisions, and then this will need to be uh, followed and have the uh, authors concisely answer the questions. Is text added to the manuscript? Is it clear or is it vague and, and, and wordy? If new figures or tables were added, have all the callouts been updated to reflect these additions? And to the additions to the manuscript to address the reviewer concerns and truly strengthen the, the work. Now, what, what is important, I think, um, if it was major revisions, that um, the author should be given one opportunity to do a set of major revisions. You want to avoid a situation where you put the authors through multiple rounds of major revisions. It's better to reject an article if you feel that the authors just didn't get it, they just were not able to revise the manuscript appropriately. At, after this stage of um, examining uh, an article with major revisions, uh, the reviewer should either accept the article, reject the article, or have a, a set of just minor points that need to be addressed. This should not be another round of major revisions because 
this isn't fair to the author and it's not really good for the reputation of the journal. So common revision mistakes and um, authors will forget to update the figure in the table numbers. Uh, they're not updating the, the, the data uh, everywhere. So the tables, the figures, the checklists, and then arguing with the review or invalid points. And it's not the expectation of the reviewer to point all of this out. I would say that if an author fails to um, come forward, with an effectively revised manuscript, it is fair to reject the article at that, um, at that point. And in fact, journals are graded on uh, the rejection uh, uh, rates as well. And the expectation is not that you're, um, you're going through multiple rounds of revisions with the author. So that is a waste of everyone's time. So some of the pearls. Before submitting an original revised manuscript, the authors should ask colleagues to look over all the work to ensure that the messaging is clear and concise. It's also a great time to do a final grammar and spelling a check. And it's the expectation of a reviewer that the article be carefully written. Um, it is not the responsibility of the reviewer to be an editor, but if there are language issues, these should be flagged. That's not to say that an article that has some language issues but is otherwise excellent should be re uh, rejected. Not at all, not at all. I think if the science is good and there just needs to be some editorial work done, then this can be handled. It's okay for the authors to request additional time from the journal to submit revisions. So typically the journals will place a time limit on the revisions and, and usually those time limits are fair but occasionally if additional experiments or uh, uh, additional detailed analysis is required, some additional time will be required and, and, it's, and it's better to request this um, upfront. Now, an important task of the reviewer is to ensure the validity and the quality of the work, as well as to assess the work's novelty and potential impact on the field. You're really the guardian of the science as a reviewer. The author should use the feedback from the reviewers as an opportunity to improve their manuscript. And so in a sense, the reviewer also has a mentoring relationship. And so you can assist uh, the authors with enhancing the science. And ultimately when the article is published, it's a reflection on the journal. So you wanna have excellent science being published in the journal. So here are a few uh, resources that you may wish to, um, uh, to consider. Uh, accessing. So I uh, referred to how to respond to the reviewer comments and I cited the calm uh, algorithm and I might refer you to the Elsevier uh, website. How to receive and respond to peer review uh, feedback. So this is uh, a nice um, uh, article that is on the APLOS uh, uh, website. And then writing the manuscript. This is actually um, uh, something that you can access through our own uh, University of uh, Toronto uh, a website. And on that note, I'll, I'll pause and I'm happy to uh, address questions. Thank you, Dr. Felling, for wonderful and very informative, uh, you know, talk. Um, especially like being author, I also feel sometimes that fairness and unbiasedness, especially the timeliness, because sometimes we submit the manuscripts and it's there for months and months. So that is very important. And you have highlighted very good thing that uh, if a reviewer is uh, writing the objective major and minor, you know, uh, comments has to be there. And I especially like the thing like you explain the calm way. That is really very important and I would like to read it definitely. So I'll uh, we can take a couple of questions if we have from the audience. Yes, sir, Dr. Chabra. Yeah, Professor Michael Fairings, uh, uh, there are responsibilities of the reviewer and the author both. Uh, we talked, we discussed if the author is uh, not agreeing with the reviewer, then the reviewer has the right to reject the manuscript. But what if 
the reviewer has not been polite and has not been scientific in the comments and the author feels that has not done justice to the manuscript per se. What should the author do? I think that this is the responsibility of the editor in chief to uh, examine the, um, the, the review and to feed this back to the reviewer because ultimately the quality of the review is a reflection on the editor in chief and it's a reflection on the journal. So I think this is an opportunity to, uh, to mentor the reviewer as well. These are volunteers in, in the field. Um, but it is very important that the reviewer at all times be polite and, and cordial. Uh, so sometimes if an article just is not of very good quality, then okay, and one can you know, politely indicate that the article uh, does not meet the, the standards and provide a brief summary of that, but it should always be very polite and, and cordial. And there are, as we recognize sometimes, professional differences of opinion in the way we manage cases and we approach things. So we're aware of this in terms of opinions on operative and non-operative management and so on and so forth. But in the end, it's important to be respectful of other people's viewpoints. So I think it is the expectation of everyone that the reviewer be always be polite and cordial. And similarly, in the author's response, it's extremely important to be polite and cordial. And occasionally a difference of opinions will, um, will exist. And this, if handled correctly, it can make a journal article actually quite interesting because sometimes points of controversy can be interesting. And in fact, it can be the source of an editorial and sometimes controversial articles can be highly cited, in fact. Um, so there's ways to handle this kind of, um, of a dialogue, but the expectation always is, to, is for the discussion to be professional and to be polite. It's a professional expectation of all of us. Uh, would you support an open review or a blinded review? What, uh, uh, what do you think um, uh, is more scientific and adds more value? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, Professor Chabra. I'm not sure I know the answer, to be honest. I've participated in both types of reviews. I guess if you were asking my personal opinion, I, I believe that a blinded review is still better because I think that it allows one to be critical in a professional way. Um, and, you know, we have in our field, we very often will know the authors who are submitting the article. And it can sometimes be a bit uncomfortable if you're critical in a professional way of a colleague. And you may respect the colleague, but, you know, you don't like the article. And, I, but, you know, I'm aware of the counterpoint as well. I know that the BMJ, for example, is increasingly going to the open reviews and I've participated in this process and it's been okay. Um, but personally, I, I prefer for this to be blinded. Mm. Yeah, so we can wait for a couple of more questions if uh, from the audience or from Ortho TV, if you have got. Yeah, could I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Professor Spellings. Uh, I asked this question to the previous uh, keynote speaker in the last uh, meeting that we had on Sunday, the first part of this meeting. And the question I repeat to you is, how do you make this being a reviewer something interesting for a person because there's really no real credit given to the person. So is there a process by which you make it, you know, noteworthy for the person to become a reviewer? Oh, that's a very good point. And um, that's a very good point. So I think if I can kind of paraphrase the point, 
is that, you know, there's an element of altruism that is associated with being a reviewer, but sometimes altruism only goes so far and it, it can be an enormous time commitment and a professional commitment. And, and how does this become increasingly recognized? So, you, you know, I, I actually have this discussion with a number of journals because there's a lot of pressure to have timely reviews, but the reviewers are doing this on a volunteer basis. So a number of journals have taken the approach to um, acknowledge the reviewers. So you get a certificate if you've done a number of these reviews or a letter from the editor thanking you. Some journals even have awards for the top reviewer of the year, so on. I, you know, I don't know if that's necessary, but I, I think some kind of a recognition. And then um, in my role at the University of Toronto as the vice chair, one of my jobs is that I evaluate every single faculty member's academic performance. And one of the metrics that we now are recognizing is uh, the participation as a journal reviewer, okay? I won't say that it's as high a metric as say your own publications, but I think that it is um, increasingly recognized that this is, um, you know, that this is, imp is important. And so I think your point is well taken. And I think that the journals are getting this and I'm seeing this increasingly that the journals are recognizing and acknowledging, um, you know, the work of the, uh, of the reviewers. Thank you. I'm happy, by the way, to provide a copy of my lecture because I know I had a few websites on there. So, for example, uh, the com. That would be great. Uh, that would be great. So I'm nice. happy to Thank do you. that. And then I had a slide that was a bit dense uh, with the Equator website with the different um, kind of metrics. Um, the, you know, some of the important ones there are the consort metrics for the randomized uh, trials. Strobe, I think, is um, actually quite helpful for journals to start using to just check uh, that all of the points are done for uh, observational studies and so on. But I'm happy to uh, to provide that um, you know that re that reference as well. And in fact, uh, Professor Michael Failings will look forward to. Uh, your talk in a forthcoming webinar, which we could have on manuscript writing, because I think being a most prolific author, uh, we'll, uh, all our participants would be able to benefit a lot from your experience in that regard. I'm yeah, very happy to do that. If there are no questions, Gayatri, we can move on. And if there are any queries uh, later, I'm sure Professor Michael Fairlings would be happy to answer them on the email as well. Okay, thank you very much and good day. Are you, uh, yeah, Gayatri has some formalities to be completed. So just- Yeah, yeah because this is virtual event. Yeah, this is the thing like we could have done like if you are here in person. So thank you so much for your informative talk. I request our IT team to just play a video for you. Thank you so much. It is prepared for you. Oh, great.
Thank you. That, Thank is, you. Uh, that was lovely. Thank you very much. It was just uh, from our side, just to give you thanks, you know. Yeah, thank you so much. So we will move on to the next uh, session. Take care, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye. So this is a day two program first session, which is on navigating to various types of articles. We have uh, with us uh, Dr. Anupam and Dr. Alok as a panelist, and Dr. Sasinder is the moderator. Dr. Sasinder is the vice chair of SI Court Education Committee. He is he is specialized in orthopedic uh, trauma and working in Apollo Hospital, Muscat. He is an executive member of Research Education and Mentorship Committee, SI Court. He is honorary member of South American Orthoscopy Society. He is a section editor in three different journals, JCOT, IJO, JSSM. He is authored chapter in Springer on orthoscopy and cartilage. He is a chief in editor in chief in a Springer book and orthopedic implantology. Faculty, he is a faculty of National and International Ortho, uh, Orthoscopy Conferences. Welcome, uh, Dr. Asasinder. And over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gayatri. Uh, let me please share my screen. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, to the JCOT editorial team and Dr. Chabra for giving me this wonderful opportunity to moderate this session. So the session is going to be on navigating through different types of articles as a reviewer. So my panelists are Dr. Alok Sud and Dr. Anupam Prakash. Let me please introduce Dr. Alok Sud. Dr. Alok Sud is the Director, Professor and Unit Head of Orthopedics at Lady Hardin Medical College, New Delhi. He is Commonwealth Fellow, Pediatric Orthopedics and Spinal Deformity from Royal Hospital for Sick Children, Edinburgh. He has more than 25 years of teaching experience and has authored textbook of orthopedics for undergraduate second edition, contributed many chapters in postgraduate books, and is also section editor for pediatric orthopedics for Indian Journal of Orthopedics and JCOT. He is expert advisor to the Union Public Service Commission and is also examiner for NBE. Welcome, sir. And we also have Dr. Anupam Prakash, who is Professor of Medicine at Lady Hardin Medical College. He is Editor-in-Chief of the Indian Journal of Medical Specialities, Associate Editor, APA Textbook of Medicine. He has 285 publications. He is President of Delhi Diabetic Forum, Indian Society for Atherosclerosis Research, Member of the Governing Body of Association of Physicians of India, and Faculty Member of the Council of ICP. Welcome, Dr. Anupam. Thank you so much for uh, accepting to be panelists for this session on navigating through different types of articles. So, um, Dr. Gayatri, do you think I should stop sharing my screen because it is also good to see the panelists? How do you want to proceed? Yeah, yeah. And it, like, if you want to show the questions, that is okay. If you want to just yeah. show because the screen. I think the viewers should be able to see the panel. Questions, the yeah, panel. that will be. So you can put this on the presentation mode. Okay. So the first question is for Dr. Alok. Dr. Alok, what, um, what do you exactly mean by original articles? Original articles is kind of a, a general term. What are the steps that as a reviewer I have to go through? when reviewing an original article? And what are the points that can fill the decision for a reviewer into accepting the article or rejecting that? Dr. Alok. Yeah, good evening, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Sushinder, for a good uh, introduction. Uh, uh, well, after listening to uh, Professor Fellings, uh, he has told so many things, both for the authors as well as for the reviewers, because actually the authors, they will uh, become reviewers in the future. So the talk was very pertinent to both of uh, both the sides. Uh, so the, number one, the question was, the, what is an original article? 
So basically the term original article was inserted to differentiate it from the systematic reviews and from the meta-analysis because these articles, they look at different articles, different studies. Whereas an original article is the work of a, a single group of uh, researchers or a single individual. And this is a, a kind of, uh, in this kind of research, all sorts of studies come, the observational studies, the cohort studies, the case control, the randomized control trials. What doesn't come under an original article is a meta-analysis uh, because it looks at a number of uh, uh, articles and the review articles, because that is what is, uh, you know, the experience of uh, uh, experienced author. Coming to the second question, that is the steps to review an original article. Now, uh, you know, this is uh, why we have collected over here, because we want to learn the re reviewing process. Now, before we want to learn the reviewing process, we must know what is the aim. Like before we do a surgery, we must know what is the aim of the surgery? What is the outcome of the surgery going to be? So before we start reviewing, we must know what it, what is the ultimate aim? The ultimate aim is to strengthen the scientific research, right? An article may carry a very good message, but it may have been presented shabbily in, 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 not, in not a good, very uh, presentable manner. So it is the duty of the reviewer to improve upon this article. On the other hand, uh, you know, it might be a, a very nicely presented article, but it is not adding anything to the existing knowledge base. And therefore, it is not building up to a scientific research. And uh, that is why this article needs to be rejected. So that is the basic aim of the review, to strengthen the scientific research. Now, how do we review it? Now, uh, reviewing an article, uh, you know, it, is, it can be made as pleasant as reading a book. It depends upon your attitude. Suppose you go to a bookstore, you select a book, you first go through, uh, through it superficially. That is the first read. And now you think that there is something for me to read in it. Uh, then you buy the book and then you read the book in detail. It is similar to review this paper. Once you become a reviewer, an article comes to you, you first go through superficially. I mean, it's a skim read. What personally I feel is that once the article comes to you, accept the review, what you see is, uh, what is the main question which is being investigated by the by the authors, right? Now, where do you look for it? The main question will be usually present in the title itself, in the abstract, in the introduction, in the keywords. These uh, uh, areas will give you what the authors are trying to investigate and you will come to know what is this article all about. The second thing on the first read, which I'll go through is that, uh, uh, what are the methods which uh, uh, the investigators have used? After that, the results, and after that, I'll see the conclusion. And now the first read uh, will usually tell me the overall coherence, the overall presentation, and as and when you become experienced, you can also know whether this article is acceptable or it will be rejected on the first read itself. But that doesn't mean that you do not uh, give a detailed second reading to this article. A detailed second reading is extremely important. Now, whenever we are doing a first read, our time will be wasted if we do not make notes. So always sit with the with a paper and pen in your head, hand, and keep writing down whatever comes to your mind. Right? Suppose if the title is not correct, suppose the conclusion and title they do not match with each other, just write in a word because that will save a lot of time in the second read. The purpose of the first read is to know the main question, the originality, the authenticity, and the coherence. Sometimes when you, are, uh, you have done enough reviews, you will also be able to know the major flaws within the first read. Uh, and as I told you that a general sense of acceptance and reduction can be made on the first read itself. Coming to the second read. Second read is the most more detailed read, right? So uh, once you are sitting for a second read, you must uh, spend some uninterrupted time with the article, right? It may take around half an hour to 45 minutes to go through the second read, maybe sometimes one hour also. You must sit with the paper and pen, that is absolutely necessary. And the approach should, should be section by section. So we must start with title, abstract, keywords, and introduction. As I told you that all these things will tell you the main hypothesis, the main question to be investigated, uh, uh, by the authors. Now, uh, why else it is important to uh, give a good article with specific keywords? 
because it also helps the readers to find the published work. Suppose an uh, article uh, gives a good message, but the title does not match with it. So when, you are, when the readers are scrolling through the titles, they may not pick up your article. So that is why a good title with specific keywords is absolutely necessary. A view on the abstract is also very important. In abstract, the reviewers must look into that all the summary, uh, all the spirit on which the article is based is written in the abstract. Also, the reviewers must uh, assess that unnecessary information or information which does not appear in the main text is not written in the, uh, uh, in the abstract also. Coming to material and method. Now, material method, why it is important to go through material and method? Because uh, actually, uh, it will uh, answer the question how this study has been done. Whereas the earlier parts, the introduction, the titles, they will tell you why this study has to be done. How is answered by material and method? So the method section should be clear and reproducible. That is, your methods should be reproducible by others. They should be clearly defined outcomes. They should, there should be no subjectivity in methods. There should be objectivity in methods. You should see that all ethical permissions, consents, competing interests are dealt with in materials and methods. If some implant is used, if a drug is being used, if a material is being used, then they, uh, the company must be identified with its location, whether it is made in India, whether it is made in US, whether it is made wherever it is made, it should be clearly written in this. If the previously used techniques are being referenced, then uh, they must be represented in the bibliography. But suppose, uh, but you should uh, also look for that uh, previously known techniques, they are not written in detail, right? Because you already know that this, uh, this technique has appeared in such and such paper, such and such textbook. So you should uh, make the authors aware that this is not required. The repetition of technique is not required because ultimately the scientific space in a journal is limited and it is very valuable. Uh, so after going from material and method, what we see is results and figures. So whatever we deduce from material and methods is written in results, right? So uh, author who is new may overlap material and method and results, and it is the duty of reviewer to correct this, right? So the results should be different from material and methods and should contain only the results and not the methods, right? The results may be presented in the form of text. They may be presented in the form of tables, in the uh, presented the tom, uh, in the in the in the form of figures. But they sh there should be no duplication. As I told you, that the space in the journal is very valuable, and therefore it is the duty of the reviewer to limit this space with absolutely necessary tables, charts, and figures. Now we have a separate uh, 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 we have a separate uh, thing on. Uh, statistics. Therefore, I will not be going into that. But uh, any reviewer should have basic uh, 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 basic training in statistics. Now, it is not something very great. I mean, you should know about the sample size, about the appropriate use of common statistical tests, potential sources of bias, uh, percentages, mean values, how to uh, uh, how to calculate p values. All these things, basic statistics should be known by all. However, if you feel that the statistics is being too intimidating and you do not understand it, obviously it can be referred to the uh, uh, to the editor in chief uh, or to a statistician. But you should think in your mind that this intimidating statistics is no cover up to uh, enhance the quality of a not so good article. So that should be borne in mind, right? In the garb of uh, a great statistical tests, the article is nothing that should be borne in mind by the reviewer. So you should know the basic question and the basic answer, what, it is, uh, what is being answered. So discussion and conclusion. So what, what is uh, important in discussion? Usually, you know, authors, they will interpret the results in discussion. They will place them in context with the previous studies. And they will also write about the impact of this research on future research. They will also write about the strengths, weaknesses, limitations of the study. And the reviewer should, you know, look for all the subheadings in the discussion. The discussion must fit well with the title, with the main question, with the conclusion, and it must fit well with the interpretation. Now, every uh, whatever we are going through in the reviewing process should be coherent. 
uh, incoherent review, an uh, incoherent paper will result in an incoherent review and ultimately rejection. So that is what is being looked for in the second grade. So uh, what is it? Let us summarize in the second grade. It is the originality, the coherence, the authenticity, and uh, the addition of the uh, ad addition to the knowledge base. Uh, yes, uh, plagiarism and uh, all these issues have to be looked for, but I think plagiarism, uh, we have a separate session on plagiarism. So, Dr. Sasinda, what was the third question? So, um, yeah, what are the uh, points that took the decision into acceptance suggestion? I think you have answered that also, so it should be clear. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. We will go on to the question on cohort study. This is uh, to Dr. Anupam. Dr. Anupam, do you think all cohort studies are publishable? What are the red flags you want to find out in a cohort study to reject them? Or in other words, what are uh, the positives that you have to look for in a cohort study to publish them? Good day, Dr. Sasinder, and good day, Dr. Alok Sud, and all the experts, panelists here. And uh, the question, as is expected of reviewers, Dr. Sasinder has said, what are the red flags to reject a case uh, a cohort study? So I would say reviewers' job is definitely very difficult. Already Dr. Fellings has start, stated that. But yes, I would say that when you talk of a cohort study, then you have to understand that, yes, the first thing is that it is separate from a case series. The cohort studies are difficult to conduct because you have the population right now, maybe a, you have a post-knee transplant population and you are looking for five-year complication rate or maybe short-term complication rate. So then that cohort you have to follow for that particular period. So as a reviewer, you have to first of all see, apart from all these things that are, like Dr. Alok Sud has already said, you have to, particularly in a cohort study, you have to see the selection of a cohort. So if the selection of the cohort is well-defined and then it is followed adequately, and the attrition is not so much, then that cohort study is actually, you can go ahead and think about publishing that cohort study. So cohort study has to be very nicely, actually it is a very resource intensive way. And uh, once you plan a cohort study, so reviewers will not reject it easily unless until there are severe methodological flaws. So the first thing is the most important is that cohort has to be very uniquely, deserved. you are very elegantly defined. The other thing is then you have to follow that cohort and that mechanism of following up has to be mentioned. And for all studies as uh, the strobe statement, so you have to have that checklist with you. And when you uh, assess that as a reviewer, then you have to see all that those points have to be there. And that flow chart is very important. All authors should make a flow chart, whether it is a RCT, whether it is a cohort study, whether it is a, stro a systematic review, that flow diagram has to be there Initially, there were 500 patients, then 50 per 50 dropped out because of some reason, 25 joined in a cohort after six months. Maybe all those things have to be very clearly defined and how many were actually analyzed at the end of the day. So that will actually determine how elegantly you have described it. So that is what the reviewers look for it. And as a reviewer, it is important to see the flow chart. If the, the, that is the first thing in most of the RCTs and cohort studies, if that flow chart is there, you understand because that gives you a view of how the study was conducted. And then actually, then you have to go to the integrated is when you are, once you are satisfied that the cohort study has been done nicely, as Dr. Alok Sud was saying, the methodology is very important. Once that methodology is there, then you have to see then you will go to the statistics part and the tables part, as Dr. Felling was saying. Because in a cohort study, you will have to see whether the data point, the subset, the denominator is the same as what the uh, actual evaluation was. And then you have to see the results. And if the results are convincing, so then definitely the cohort study would be, the reviewers will give you a positive feedback. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Anupam. Um, Regarding control trial, again, the question is to Dr. Anupam. What should I look for in a case control study or in a control trial or in an RCT? Uh, and tell me something about concert guidelines for RCTs. So RCTs, again, they are the considered gold standard and they are the level one evidence. So whenever an RCT is planned, the foremost thing that all reviewers have to seek is whether it is registered with the CTRI for Indian trials 
or for national uh, clinical trials repositories you have to see for us they are registered on the ctri.com also and that is important so the registration with a central repository the national repository is important the clinical trial repository of india the ctri.nic.in is the one which is there in india so that is the icmr portal that you can always get and you have to register all clinical trials on that so again in control trials as the dr sasinder has already mentioned the consort guidelines so consort guidelines are nothing but consolidated a statement on reporting of clinical trials so con is consolidated reporting or a statement on reporting of clinical trials so this is a standardized way where you should report so anybody who uh, reports a clinical trial will have to ideally submit a consort guideline and again there should be consort flow chart so everything is available right now you can check on the website also and it is in summary that flow chart will tell you how many patients actually were screened how many patients were randomized how many patients refused to participate how many patients were dropouts and in the end how many patients actually completed the trial so if you had two arms you will have two arms with equal or maybe slightly different numbers so depending upon where, what was the uh, mode of randomization and all those things will be there in the flow chart and then the consort guidelines have a checklist and when you sub the reviewer should ideally have that checklist in hand and most of the journals will provide whenever there is an rct there is a column there and you have to see whether the consort checklist has been filled up with the by the author and that you have to check if everything is filled up then it makes your job very easy and then you the obviously the first thing is abstract wherein you are seeing whether the results are interesting or not if the results are not interesting if the methodology is weak then definitely you will not go ahead with publishing such a control trial so but one thing is mandatory the registration with the national portal is mandatory in each country and that you should always seek so that is one thing what was the other question the steps to execution i already said that is the consort checklist that you have to see and consort guidelines so all clinical trials all systematic these for systematic reviews as dr felling has shown for systematic reviews and meta analysis you have the prisma statement and the prisma guidelines that have been recently updated in 2020 consort guidelines are available for clinical trials and for observational studies you have the strobe uh, format or the strobe guidelines so whenever you are submitting a paper you should use these guidelines he has already told the case care guidelines k c a r e for case reports so c a is for case r e is for report so care guidelines so you don't have to cram up all these things but yes care for case reports and case series strobe for observational studies control trials you have consort guidelines and prisma for systematic reviews and meta analysis so they are ready checklists that are available and these are free tools many journals have published them and you can get hold of them and as a reviewer it is important because this is the checklist that will be furnished by the authors because it is mandatory all author guidelines all journal guidelines actually mention that they should be completed whenever these such articles are submitted so you should always go ahead and uh, check uh, for these things well i think that answers the questions if any yeah. more i will be glad to answer yeah dr danupan that is very clear thank you very much and this question is for dr alok uh Dr. Alok, how do this uh, review article different from an original article? What are the points to be considered while peer reviewing a review article? Uh, see, a uh, uh, review article is uh, based upon experience of uh, an individual or a group of uh, researchers. Uh, the differentiating feature from an original article is that uh, it doesn't contain any method. It will usually doesn't contain any method. uh it will tell you about the uh, exp- a- 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 about the treatment or about the outcome or about the intervention uh, a- in a group of disorders or in a disorder based upon the experience of that person now that person uh, um, is usually a stalwart in his uh, uh, in his own field and that is why you have to respect his uh, experience at the same time uh, we must as a reviewer try to differentiate a review article from a summary a review article is not a book chapter or a summary of thesis as uh, many review articles are uh, presented in uh, in our journal uh, in any journal uh, they may appear like uh, you know summary or a book chapter so you have to as a reviewer differentiate in between these two so uh, what is most important in a review article is that it should be unbiased 
it's not like if i am using this material or this drug i should be biased for this and i should present a review article for that so that kind of bias should be absent and the review should look for that that is the most important thing to look for thank you ma'am dr alok um, again this question is for dr anupam uh, what are systematic reviews and meta analysis how should i assess it what is a good system what is a good systematic review and meta analysis well these days uh, rcts were considered the gold standard but now systematic reviews and meta analysis are also considered level 1 evidence and uh, it is not exactly a narrative review as dr alok sud has just dealt with those are narrative reviews but systematic reviews are about interventions so these interventions could be therapeutic with drugs or surgery they could also be theoretical be theoretical like i mean social interventions so these interventions whenever we decide upon interventions so you can have a single rct on that you may have two rcts you may have multiple randomized control trials rcts on that so when you analyze all these rcts in different done by different authors in different continents or maybe in a particular area and with the same aim and then you take all that data reanalyze pull it and then again reanalyze it then that becomes a systematic review and meta analysis now systematic review is one shot of meta analysis systemic theoretic review is that you are reviewing all the you have a research question and all the clinical trials which had addressed that research question you are going to review them so that becomes a systematic review so you take all those there are five authors who have worked in the last five years that is your criteria on probably uh, hip replacement with a particular processes so that you are testing so all rcts you have included you find five rcts in the last five years which you actually and think that yes it is significant one rct may have 50 patients the other rct may have n number the one rct may have 500 patients so all those will be pulled all those data which you can get together you will try to pull the data of all these five rcts and arrive at a cumulative number and then when you reanalyze it subject it to a statistical analysis on that pooled group that is called a meta analysis if you just review the data of different uh, rcts and report it it is a systematic review so if you are not putting it to statistical analysis it stops one st step short and then it is a systematic review if you review all that data pool it draw the effect sizes because those with a larger sample size less standard deviation will have a greater effect size then you determine the confidence intervals pooled confidence intervals intervals draw forest plots then that actually becomes a meta analysis and that is again level 1 evidence these days as good as rcts because it is a combination of all rcts so again you will have to follow the prisma guidelines the prisma statement and the prisma checklist for that and uh, the other thing is when you are evaluating these you should also see whether it is relevant because these rcts at times you may have unequivocal results which are available and then you actually don't need to go ahead with rcts and they are part they are, go ahead with these systematic reviews or meta analysis so it is important that they are therapy based so it is yes now we are extending it to even observational studies so with observational studies you have some slightly separate criteria most of them are software based so softwares would help uh, the authors out and uh, as a reviewer you will have to see again that flow chart you have to see how many rcts were included what period of time what was the research question then how many rcts you could not the authors could not evaluate maybe they did not uh, provide them the data maybe they were not available open access maybe they could not contact the authors so if five were there and only three were analyzed so you have to have at least two rcts for a determining a systematic review you cannot have one rct and then review that and just publish it again so at least two rcts have to be there on a particular topic and on common topics you may have a large number of rcts so as a reviewer it becomes very difficult at times and yes as dr felling was saying in this scenario definitely if you are not able to understand the meta analysis then you should seek a statistical review ask the editor in chief to help you with the guidelines for systematic for meta analysis and the statistician help may be forthcoming 
you may like to understand how it has gone because actually all softwares would give but yes reviewers are not available not accessible can they cannot uh, counter check it but yes most of the times it is clear and you when you go through the uh, statement of the authors and the paper it is more or less clear whether the meta analysis has been done nicely or not i think that answers all the three questions yeah yeah dr anupam thank you very much uh, now the question is dr alok so this is about case report do you think dr alok do you think case reports can contribute enough to the existing knowledge what is a good case report uh see uh, usually you know uh, a young researcher will usually come up uh, maybe he uh, the first uh, research he comes up with is a is a case report but you know the case report uh, it ranks very low in the hierarchy of evidence because uh, of probability of bias you know uh, the researcher may have come across that intervention or come across that uh, uh, case for the first time in his uh, research career but it might be already existing and might have been published several times so uh, you know probability biases uh, of biases there and moreover you know case reports they carry that you know uh, burden of anecdotal evidence so that is why most of the case reports which are coming to the reviewers uh, will get rejected uh, to be very frank however the bright side of uh, uh, of publishing a case report is that they share individual patient management experiences right so sometimes the case report is so powerful so good it is uh, such a novel uh, some such a novel technique or such a novel disorder has been described that that forms the basis of a new hypothesis so that is why you know publication of the case report should not be altogether negated uh, they should be encouraged but uh, uh, with the unbiased sense and they should not carry any anecdotal kind of evidence uh, definitely case reports should be encouraged good case reports yeah thank you so much dr alok uh this question is dr anup uh, and dr anupam should i be worried about the plagiarism how much is too much and uh, uh, what what is your opinion about preprint publications well plagiarism is a strict no these days and uh, as a reviewer we should not be worried about plagiarism that is number one because most of the journals now when they ask the reviewer to review a article they have already put the uh article through the plagiarism check and uh, if you go to the website if the reviewers go to the website and they click they most of us as reviewers are ignorant about it but if you check for the plagiarism the report would be available because editor or the technical editor or the managing editor would have already checked for plagiarism so that report would be available but yes that does not absolve the reviewer if the reviewer thinks that it is a cut paste job you should always write back to the editor that yes i think that this article has a lot of plagiarism and uh, please let me know the percentage of plagiarism or just check it and uh, send it back to me how much is the plagiarism because i feel that uh, there is a lot of cut paste job or the uh, article appears more monotonous than actually it should have been so and uh, yes the percentage uh, ideally no plagiarism but yes up to 10% is acceptable more than 10% is not but that 10% again should not be from one particular uh, book or author uh, most uh, 1 to 2% from a particular source is acceptable so virtually that means no plagiarism acceptable similarity index is uh, should be absolutely nil and if you virtually write in your own words then you will understand that every time you write even your own chapter or even your own article it will be varying and it will be different so there is no question of plagiarism if we are writing it originally because i also write chapters and uh, articles and if you are writing it originally not copying it from any source not from my review article or from a chapter then it would come to hardly 1 2 3 4 5% percent at, uh, at the most but when we are actually not understanding the results and just copying it then the plagiarism high but yes i understand as a reviewer it is very difficult but you are not supposed to worry the editor in chief's responsibility is there dr chabda would be a, uh angry upon me for this but yes he has already done the job his team would be doing the job at the back end and then sending the articles to you that is what is the premise most of the journals would not actually waste the effort of reviewer just because after a later date you find that it is highly plagiarized so they are actually rejected on the first instance 
But yes, if you still feel it, at times it can escape attention of the editor or the technical editor or the person who is there in the editor's office. So at times you should be vigilant about plagiarism also. And the third is, should I worry about preprint publications? So preprint publications are not to be worried about. Most of the sites would actually mention that uh, the authors have to acknowledge. That is not that authors should not acknowledge. Authors have to acknowledge that they have already submitted the paper for preprint publication on that. So if there are some MIDR, XIV and all those things, those are preprint publications which are in the open domain where you actually ask for comments and you are just uh, ask, uh, getting it reviewed openly. So those are permissible to the extent depending upon the editor or general's policies and that is okay. But yes, if preprint publication has been there more than an abstract somewhere in a reputed journal, then definitely it cannot be uh, given a go ahead. But yes, those sites which are there where you can actually put up your paper for feedback from others, they are not actually permanent sites and they will not give you the, the, the DOI number, the articles which you are publishing. That is not a permanent repository. So you can still publish and the author, you can, if as a reviewer, you have found that there is a preprint publication, you should definitely write it down to the editor that yes, there is a similar article with the same author and it is already published preprint. That depends upon the journal's policy, whether they take it as a publication or not. So that will vary from journal to journal. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Anupam. Uh, that uh, winds up this particular program. Thank you, thank Dr. Luxu and Dr. Anupam. Uh, it was a wonderful program and uh, we could definitely understand what exactly a reviewer has to look for in an original article, how to go into the methodology, look into the um, statistical methods, uh, whether they have uh, followed a set of guidelines throughout the program or the paper. And uh, with respect to review articles, what is a review article, um, the types, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, a review article should not be just uh, a non-scientific uh, summary writing. It should be scientifically based. And a case report or a case series can contribute enough to knowledge, uh, especially in particular uh, clinical scenarios. And they can be an introduction for the younger researchers to enter into the publication scenario. And Regarding plagiarism, I also want to point out that most of the software that we use, it gives us the results of similarity rather than plagiarism. There is a, I mean, I would like to point out a slight difference between the term similarity index and plagiarism similarity. Certain parameters, uh, certain terms like neck of femur fracture, pelvia stabula fracture, these terms cannot be changed. So it the the text can still show some similarity, like a small percentage. That does not mean that the author should be worried about it. Um, but logically, they should not copy and paste text from another paper. Um, at the maximum, they can quote a single statement, a strong statement, but they are not allowed to copy paste text from another paper, even if they quote. Okay. So I think this sums up everything. Thank you so much, Dr. Aluksu, then Dr. Anupam, and well, Dr. Just a line and Dr. Uh, Dr. to add, Dr. Sasinda, uh, more than five word phrase is considered a play, uh, similarity. So up to five yeah. words is okay. Fracture neck of femur would be three. So that is comfortable. Okay, I got you. And you got me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have answered the questions to the best of my knowledge in the chat box as was. Yeah, asked. thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Sasinda, for a wonderful session. Thank you, the panelists, Dr. Anupam and Dr. Alok. And thank you thank to you. Jacob for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, participants. So, those who are uh, watching us live, keep sending us questions. Panelists are answering these questions, but as we are running out of time. So, definitely, we have half an hour uh, activity session. During that time, we will answer all your questions uh, 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 and keep sending these questions. So the second, uh, the second session of the day is meandering through the statistical maze of the article and I am the moderator. And let me acknowledge one thing, the wonderful title has been given by Dr. Vandana. So this is really very catchy and different. So statistics, we are going to talk a lot about the statistics, which is one of the important component of the research, especially if it is an original article. So statistics when in use in misleading fashion can trick causal observations. 
uh, and into believing something other than what the data shows. The misuse of statistics occur when statistical arguments and asserts are falsehood. In some cases, it is misuse of um, that. Some cases, the misuse of statistics, it's by accidental or sometimes it's purpose, purposeful. So let's welcome our panelists to discuss that how to identify these things. We have among us two panelists, Dr. Indrayan and Dr. Agrawal. Welcome Hello. you, sir. Let me uh, share my screen. And I'm the moderator of this session. It is really not good that if you have to introduce by yourself. So I'm Dr. Gayatri Vishwakarma. I'm PhD in statistics. I'm working in Indian Spinal Injury Center as head biostatistics. I did my postdoc from University of Saskatchewan, Canada. I have just only 30 publications in peer-reviewed journal. I also worked as a visiting scientist for six months in UT Health Science Center, Tyler, USA. I am elected member of International Statistical Institute, Netherlands, and Committee of Women in Statistics. I am ethics committee member in different institute, Guru Gobind Singh, IP University, Dindal Apadhyay University, Ministry of Ayush, and ICPR, Jamia Hamdard. I love conducting training programs as this is just only the <clears throat> opportunity. And I'm also associate editor of JCOT and Frontiers in Pain Research. I welcome Dr. Indrayan, Dr. Abhay Indrayan, who is the pioneer Thank and you very much. Yeah, mentor of, uh, like, uh, I consider he is a mentor to me. He has done PhD from Ohio University, Ohio State University. He is a biostat president of Biostatistics Consortium, currently working as a biostatistic consultant in Max Healthcare. He is a former professor from uh, UCMS College. He was the only biostatistician in the country to be elected as fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, besides several other fellowship of learned academic societies. He has more than 250 publications, including five books, three of them published in CRC Press. He conducted 34 projects with WHO, World Bank, UNS, and visiting faculty of Ohio University and visiting research scientists at University of Masters. He is a fellow of Royal Statistics Society and delivered talk in 17 international conferences. Welcome you, sir. Let me welcome Dr. Rakesh Agrawal. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable time. He is MD in gastroenterology and uh, master's in um, epidemiology from uh, London School of Health and Hygiene. He is currently director of Jipmar Pondicherry. He's, he was a faculty at Department of Gastroenterology as SGPGI Lucknow for over 28 years. His focus areas are viral hepatitis, including its epidemiological, molecular immuno immunology, and economical, economic aspects. He is a member of WHO Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee on HIV hepatitis, and sexually transmitted diseases. He's a vice president and president-elect for the World Association of Medical Editor. Thank you so much for joining us. So let me uh, share my screen of the question. It's really wonderful to have two different panelists. One is the stalwart of the statistics, and another is clinician who knows statistics very well. So let's start with the question on sample size because it is the major important thing to start before starting the, you know, conducting your original research. So what are the mandatory things required to report the sample size, especially in hypothesis testing because sample size is a very vast topic. We cannot cover this in this half an hour session because we have to cover a lot of questions. So uh, Dr. Indrayan, how you will say that what are the basic required thing if you can sum up in two, three things that viewer can check it. Thank you, Gayatri. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this particular question is on hypothesis testing, but I think the sample size requirement are more stringent if your estimations, we are estimating something. But this is on hypothesis testing. Now, the hypothesis testing means that we want to find out whether a particular hypothesis is true or false, or likely to be true or likely to be false. So in this case, Mostly, we are interested in uh, difference between two groups or two or more groups. So we want to know whether a difference exists or not. Now, mostly, 
if the sample size is large or very large, then the difference will definitely arise. It will be statistically significant if the sample size is very large. So that that question whether whether the difference exists or not is kind of irrelevant in in, this, in the medical setup because because it depends on the sample size. If the sample size is very large, you will get uh, significant difference anyway. I think the question should be whether the difference is medically significant or not. And I, I, I guess that we'll discuss this later on, but then for hypothesis testing, it is essential for us to define as to what we consider as a medically important difference to be detected. Now the medically important difference to be detected is the one which can, which can change the current practice current clinical practice or clinical health practice or management of the cases or whatever. So that is required to be set up. Now this is very difficult and we will we'll probably come in, into this later on. But this is the this is the most important requirement and most studies that I review do not talk about the medically significant difference that they wish to detect in order to calculate sample size. So sample size calculation necessarily requires that we specify the minimum medically important difference, which is generally denoted by delta in our calculations. So that is the mandatory thing. But, but in, any, in, addition, in addition, the sample size also depends on particularly the standard deviation, the variance, the, how much the subjects vary from one another. It also depends on whether the uh, prevalence or the or the pi prevalence is small or large, and it, it, so it depends on these two things. It also depends on how much power do we need. Now, generally, 80% power is considered to be adequate, but that is to be specified. And lastly, we also need to specify the level of significance that we are aiming at. Now, mostly it's 5%, but that needs to be stated again. So this is the, these are the requirements for uh, calculating sample size or reporting sample size for hypothesis testing setup. Now yeah. the second question is about is low sample size very interesting as a limitation of the study. You know it depends on what. And now I I know that, and everybody knows that there are there are instances where people have conducted the study on a simple single person say one person and they have come up with uh, fantastic results. Now, uh, most popular is uh, like self experimentation done by Marshall on Helicobacter pylori and came up with a new idea that uh, the pylori can be caused by uh, some infections. Now, there are other, in the, in the history, there are examples of uh, Edward Jenner, single one, one sample, sample size one, then there are elephants are claiming uh, so the sample size one. So sample size, in fact, one of the uh, one of the important uh, advantage of a small sample size is that is that the researcher can be very careful about obtaining the information. They can use high tech high tech uh, uh, instruments, uh, and uh, very close supervision can be done. So. Sample size is not, no sample size is not necessarily a limitation. But yet, in most cases, in most cases, we do need a reasonable sample size. I will not say large. There are, in fact, many studies these days are conducted on, conducted on huge sample because, because, it, because the electronic data are available for 10,000 patients, 20,000 patients, they are already available. So we do that, but uh, those kind of, if it is available, readily available, as in this case, in the case of electronic data, it's fine. But otherwise, if you are collecting information and the primary information from the patients or from the subjects, then very large sample is not required. Generally, uh, reasonable middle type of sample is enough for, uh, for testing a wide process situation. Yeah, thank you, sir. Dr. Agrawal, what is your uh, like view on this? So I think it varies according to situation. One has to look at it in a common sense method, exactly as Dr. Indrayan said, whether it means any difference. So 
if you get a statistically significant difference with a low sample size because let us say you are doing an intervention and that is much more effective than you had thought before you started the study it may be okay to go and report the study with a low sample size in fact you may be, uh, people must be aware that there are studies which when a large difference is achieved between two treatments are stopped early because it is considered unethical to continue the study so in those situation it is okay but on the other hand sometimes the difference may appear large but it may not mean anything let us say i start a study i enroll six patients in each group in one group four persons improve 67% in the other two improve 33% even though the difference may appear that num number of people improving is double but it doesn't mean anything if one person from one group had gone to the other then we would have had three and three so that is where it is it depends on what the particular situation is thank you yeah thank you sir so uh, let us take the second question that how to assess the internal and external validity of an article this is like from a statistical point of view dr agrawal can we start with you and then we so when we read an article the authors have done something that they describe in methods and have come to a certain conclusion so internal validity looks at so what is happens is that they take patients from a particular hospital from a particular subpopulation sample and from that sample they do something and they conclude find something in the sample and from there they extrapolate it to the larger population everybody in the world internal validity looks at whether the conclusion that they have drawn based on the sample can actually be applied to their own group of people either to the sample or to that specific subpopulation now this is affected if there is bias if there is confounding external validity on the other hand refers to whether even if the results are valid for this group that they have looked at can they be applied to the larger population or can they be generalized that is external validity thank you sir dr indrayan your inputs on this yes yeah, now the to me internal validity as uh, professor agrawal has mentioned is that the results are consistent over different outcomes now for example if severity is related to death then the severity must also be related to complications and severity must also be related to hospital stay so this is the this is this is what i mean by saying that they must the results must be internally consistent now if that doesn't happen then enough reasons must be available the, the researcher must give reasons that why this this valid the the, the inconsistent results are occurring Now, if the results are, if the reasons are valid, then it's acceptable. But other, otherwise, uh, the the consistency of results across different outcomes must be uh, must be maintained. Now, the external validity, as as he has mentioned, is is the generalizability of the findings. Then it it depends on the representativeness of the sample, whether the sample is really. Uh, adequate one and whether it is really representing the population the target population that we uh, that we aim at and this, this can be now this this is this is the basic thing that for internal i just also want to mention that uh, studies are done like on a split sample which means that uh, 50% is, is kept for one purpose and 50% is kept for the validity of the findings So a split sample, and then sometimes another sample is taken. Now you take a sample, and they uh, maybe uh, you, you take one sample uh, for the year, suppose two, 2021, and you take another sample in 2022, and see whether the results are uh, same or not. So that that also can be done. So both both things are both things are important. Internal validity really tells us that yes. the research is uh, believable and the external validity tells us that yes the results can be generalized and can be applied to other settings 
uh, if I may come in, Gayatri. So I yes. absolutely agree with Professor Indrayan. Just to add one point, if there is no internal validity or if internal validity is poor, there is no point looking at external validity. So both are important, but first internal and then we go to external. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you, sir. So we are coming to the next question, which is like bothering me a lot because sometimes you also have to review it and uh, uh, see this. So like authors are mixing association with causation. Like I have uh, shown one example that eating breakfast may be teen obesity. So it is published in WebMed. So it can like, it is just showing the correlation. And if somebody is reading this article, they might get confused that, okay, eating breakfast causes or skipping breakfast causes obesity. Or, you know, if somebody is physical active or something like that. So what is your comment, Dr. Uh, uh, Indrayan? We can start with you and then we... I think the, the causation is a very strict, very strong term. And uh, I wouldn't like this to be used in um, empirical research, which is based on data. Unless, unless all kinds of factors which can possibly affect the outcome or possibly affect the result are ruled out. So then one has to, one has to think of what alternative explanations are possible and whether those alternative explanations have been ruled out or not. Now, statistically, statistically, you'll say that there must be the results must be uh, the results must be specific in the sense if that causative factor is present, then the outcome is present, and if the causative factor is absent, then the then the outcome is absent. So that specificity is required to infer causation. In most cases, in most studies, this is not done. The association is generally in, in many in many articles. Association is generally people are. Sometimes not careful, they say that uh, that this this causes that the cause effect relationship should not be inferred unless unless uh, these two particularly these two things are met. One is the one is that all alternative explanations are, ex are excluded, which means the confounding factors and so on and so forth. I really do not want to go into the technical aspects of it, but those those must be first must be ruled out and. Second, that the, the results must be specific. That if this is present, then the outcome is present. If this is absent, the outcome is absent. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Agrawal, I think you have published a wonderful article on this. Uh, so if you can say something, uh, how reviewer can assess that, uh, uh, like whether it is just only association and an author has written about the causation. Uh, so uh, the as for causation, there are several constructs. Uh, so there are uh, criteria that have been uh, put forward. So, but those are again not absolute, those are relative. So, uh, so there are uh, Bradford Hills criteria, which are very often used. The most important thing is what is thought to be the cause should have happened before uh, what we are considering as the consequent. So if we, one sees association, there can be three or four, four possibilities. One, of course, can be that there is a true causation. The second is that it is just by chance. It is, And that you will know by looking at statistical significance. If there is no statistical significance or borderline statistical significance, one has to consider that the association might have been seen just by chance. The third issue is, is there confounding or is there biased? And that is something that, you know, you need to go deeper into the study design and see whether that is responsible. And the fourth thing can actually be reverse causation. It is the, you know, uh, Already a person is overweight, if I were to use the example that you have on your slide, and therefore the person is uh, skipping breakfast. And if you look at follow these people, you would think that skipping breakfast is possibly leading to obesity, which may not be true. So it's a reverse causation. And fifth, it can be something totally different, which is causing a person to eat breakfast 
uh, and you know uh, not being obese or something so both of these could be related to the same factor for instance my class my favorite example is if you were to take 10000 people and follow them and say heart attack occurs in those who are bald it's not baldness that is causing heart attack it is not that if you do hair transplant you will prevent heart attack it is basically old age which is causing both baldness as well as heart attack i'll stop here thank you sir so our next question is how to check if statistical methodology is not fully explained data collection methods variable list outliers even missing data handling techniques so this is really important to see that how uh, the author has conducted the thing so what is your say in dr indrayan on that this is you know you have already listed few things here data collection methods are given or not uh, variable list is giving or not but the variable list must be complete in the sense that the all the antecedent factors the intervention methods the confounding factors and the outcomes everything is listed and they are properly classified so variable list has to be very comprehensive and if you have left out something you could not study if a particular researcher could not study the entire uh, in that list of factors then there must be some reasons for this and that reason must be listed in the article that such and such factor was possibly also important in this case but was but could not be studied for such and such reasons then then of course the, you have mentioned already like outliers are there and missing data techniques and then whether outliers were included or whether outliers were excluded and the outliers were excluded then what was the definition of outliers so that must be Uh, properly specified, and in case missing data are there, then what did you do about them? One is that you completely ignored them. The second is that sometimes we do imputations, and 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 sometimes we do partial, which means that some of those things are, for example, the baseline information is available, but the follow-up information is not available. So the, that if that is there, then. then this this should be properly explained and then how how do you adjust your result uh, if the missing data are there but the more important thing that i or maybe more commonly that i see in uh, research articles is that people generally write a sort of fixed language you said the uh, the qualitative variables were analyzed by chi square test and the quantitative variables were analyzed by the student t test and so on so forth not that that generally doesn't help so the the specific methods that are that are being used for that research must be mentioned and they must be justified as to why those methods are important or why those methods are required and then whether you have really checked the basic assumptions behind those methods or not the sometimes uh, the gaussian condition is required uh, and if gaussian condition is not met uh, uh, for example in case of Many biomarkers that are highly skewed value values. Then, then you use medians and IQRs, and then uh, men with me or non-parametric test kind of thing. So those those have to be specified as to where you you use this and where you use that. And in case you are using a logistic regression, what was the dependent variable? What was the outcome that you studied? And what were the antecedent factors that you studied? And so on and so forth. And whether you are giving the uh, the unadjusted odds ratio or adjusted odds ratios and then whether they are properly interpreted or not so all those things are required and we i think uh, very particular about it whether these things are completely or comprehensively explained in an article or not thank you sir so i got reminder that we are running out of time so i want to take one more important question and i want inputs of both of you that is very important i am dealing with this with the clinicians it is really important to find out the minimum clinically important difference mcid many terms come up sometimes people write mcid mcd or some other term so should it be like blindly applied or accepted as a universal fact so dr agrawal let's start with you you and then <coughs> so what is minimally clinically important difference again you know you can look at it statistically or you can look at it as a clinician 
because we have Professor Indrayan, so I leave the statistical uh, perspective to him. As a clinician, it depends what I am looking at. If I am looking at a group of patients with hypertension and their diastolic blood pressure is 110, what I am, if that is my inclusion criterion, to me, the minimum clinical important difference will be maybe 10 or 15 millimeter fall in diastolic blood pressure. On the other hand, if I were a public health professional and the idea is I should bring down the blood pressure of the whole city of Delhi on an average by, let us say, asking people to do yoga or asking people to, you know, uh, walk or something. If in a group of 500 people, I can reduce the diastolic blood pressure by three millimeters, even that is a big challenge. And that is a clinically very relevant outcome. So I think from the clinical perspective, I've tried to answer statistical aspect. I leave for Professor Indraya. No, I, I fully, I, in fact, <laughs> I, I have been, uh, I'm of the firm opinion that this is something to be decided by clinicians and not by statisticians. Now, even though there are, there are articles written by statisticians and they have tried to justify that you, you have like half of the standard deviation as the minimal uh, clinical important difference, but I, I completely agree with you that this is to be determined by clinicians considering the clinical setup and say whether, yes, this kind of difference will change the, the existing mechanism or existing management or existing setup or whatever. If, if it is not capable of changing our current thinking, then it's not, it's not clinically important. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, like, it's a wonderful session. Thank you, Dr. Agrawal. Thank you, Dr. Indrayan. So Thank let you. me sum up with this. Like it was, we discussed about the sample size calculation or hypothesis testing. So Dr. Indrayan said that, yes, minimal clinical important difference that which you have to put in the uh, sample size, that is very important from where you are taking and how you are putting it. With this, definitely power of the study and level of significance which you have to take. Now, coming to the internal and external validity, it was well explained by both the speakers, both the panelists, it, especially Dr. Agrawal has highlighted that internal validity is more important because it looks at the consistent with the different. If internal consistency is not there in the article, there's no point of checking the external validity. And for external validity, Dr. Indrayan said generalizability is very important and you have to check that whether author has given appropriate statistical or sampling method for this, represent, it is a representative sample or not. For the causation and association, that is a confusion, uh, it, it is generally occur. So alternative explanation has to be given for this, especially as Dr. Agrawal said, the criteria, Bradfield Hill criteria that can be used. And also it is explained that we can see the significance of the correlation and check if there is any confounding factors available or not. For this last minimal clinical important difference, it has to be decided clinically. So that is the good point which we have uh, learned today. Thank you so much. So let's move to the next question. And as I am telling you that we are going to take all the questions from the viewers. So please keep asking these questions. We are here. We have some editorial board members other than the panelists who will be able to answer it. So let's move to the next session. Thank you, Gayatri. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. So our next session is on how to write a review report. And that is very important because, you know, as a reviewer, we generally, what are, what should be the criteria and what should be the term, what we have to write. We should not say directly no or it rejected or something. This is also an art. So today we have with us Dr. Rajiv Tukral, who is moderating this session. And we have two stalwarts uh, among us, Dr. Y.K. Gupta and Dr. Paula. So Dr. Rajiv Tukral is the Associate Director of Orthopedic and Head of the Joint Replacement Team from Asian Institute of Medical Sciences, Faridabad. And he is also visiting Senior Consultant at Apollo Hospital, Noida and Greater Noida. He is Associate Editor of JCOD and Associate Editor of IJO. 
He is organizing secretary for numerous scientific writing workshops under the JCOT and IGO. He is a reviewer of BJJ, JOT, EJOST for more than 10 years. He authored many books and chapters on primary and complex knee and hip replacement uh, of elsewhere and JP publications. He has more than 20 publications in peer-reviewed international journal. His area of interest is arthroplasty, arthroscopy, and complex trauma. Over to you, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, thank you so much, Gayatri, for introducing me. And uh, I'm just going to share my screen because... Uh, And this is going to be an interesting uh, session because if we've gone through the entire gamut, right, from, you know, yeah. how to start. Am I audible, by the way? Yeah, yeah, you are very much audible. All right. So this is going to be an interesting session because we've been through the entire gamut of how to actually, you know, uh, have your uh, review uh, ordered. But now we're coming to the point where we're actually going to write the review. And uh, we have... Uh, Dr. Rajiv, sorry, yeah, you have to... Yeah, I am, I am, I am. I am. <laughs> I just saw your slides of questions. So no, 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 yeah. no, no. So, uh, so I have to introduce two very eminent panelists. Uh, the first one is Dr. Vaikit Gupta. He is the principal advisor of projects at uh, what we call the Translational Health Science and Technology Institute, which is based interestingly in Faridabad. I didn't know that. I just checked it up today. And uh, apart from that. He is, he is, of course, uh, just a second, please. I'm having a little bit of a problem. Yeah, yeah, okay. And apart from that, he's uh, had fellowships from numerous societies, the National Academy of Medical Sciences, the Indian Pharma Pharmacological Society, the National Academy of Science, Indian Academy of Neurosciences, and the Society of Toxicology. He's got a vast writing experience in terms of publications and chapters and books. He is the editor of the Indian Journal of Physiology and Pharmacology. He's won numerous medals as well. Uh, he is currently the president of AIMS Bhopal and Jammu and Kashmir and the president of the Society of Toxicology of India. And he's retired as the Dean Academics uh, from AIMS. So welcome, sir. Uh, with us also, we have Dr. Paula Camargo. Uh, she is from Brazil. She's done her bachelor's, of her master's and a PhD all from the same university. And now she is the associate professor at the same university, the Federal University of Sao Carlos. Welcome, Paula. Uh, she is uh, the editor in chief of the Brazilian Journal of Physiotherapy, has led multiple national and international projects on the subject, more than 80 articles in peer reviewed journals. And she, I was just looking at her uh, profile online. And I see that she has intensive exposure and intensive uh, writing experience, authorship, editorship on the shoulder and the biomechanical problem related to the shoulder. And that's me, so you've already been introduced. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna try to get everybody involved and we're gonna try to uh, make it a little interesting for everyone. All right, so first I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Paola, what are the components of a good report? I mean, you've, you've gone through the entire gamut. Now you want to write this review report to the authors waiting with bated breath. What are the things you're going to do? What are the components of this report? Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very honored to be here and share some of my experience as an editor in chief for the Brazilian Journal in the last eight years. So, um, the components for a good critical review report, I think it starts before accepting the invitation to review the, the paper, okay? So before accepting the invitation, you need to make sure that the study belongs to your field of expertise. Because if you're uh, reviewing a paper that is in your field of expertise, it's gonna be much easier for you to provide a good critical review and help the authors, okay? And then before starting the review, you need to make sure that you have the time to make the review, okay? You don't need to start a review saying, okay, I'll do this in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, because it's gonna take longer you have to spend a very good time to write a good review report. So make sure you have time to start the review. And 
it's also important that you are in a good mood. We all know that when we are not in a good mood, you tend to dislike things more. So make sure you are in a good mood. So what are the components? I consider the main components to, to write a good critical review report. Uh, first, you should write in simple and good language. So authors should clearly understand what you want, okay? You should always be gentle and polite. Don't be rude. So imagine you are the author and the kind of review you'd like to receive, okay? I think all of us have got many review reports and you know which ones you like the most. So try to do the same. So imagine yourself in the shoes of the authors, okay? Try to help. Write things in a way you'd say to someone in person. It's very common to see people being impolite and that's not how they would behave if they were talking to, to the person. Then you should, you should think about the impact of the study. Be open to new ideas, okay? So don't try to take the authors to what you want. You should try to improve what they are presenting. So be open to new ideas. Tell the authors how to improve the paper by making statements showing your rationale, okay? Uh, so it's always important to provide useful advice and making a constructive and objective report can make a huge difference to the authors. Uh, this study is gonna improve and make your efforts more rewarding in my opinion, because we know it's a, it takes a long time for us to, to make a good report. So when uh, writing this report, I think you can think on some core questions. You can also use the reporting guidelines that people have already talked about. But there are some core questions uh, that you should think when writing the report, but making suggestions on how to improve. So some of the core questions. Does this study contribute to the current knowledge? Are the objectives and methods clearly stated? Are there sufficient details uh, to allow replicability of the study? Are methods and analysis appropriate and well described? What are the strengths and limitations of the study? And if, if there are any serious flaws that invalidate the study? So I think this questions can guide you when reviewing the papers, but you should keep in mind that you should provide suggestions to improve. Okay, so, so these are... Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Paulo. It was very concise and very precise, I'd say. How about you, Dr. Gupta? Would you like to add something onto this or you think she's covered everything? Dr. Gupta, sir, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yes. I think uh, she covered a lot, but I will just cover two, three points here. Sure. A, when you are asked by an editor to review a paper, what you should start with? First, I expect if I am getting a paper to be reviewed, I expect that I would be provided with an abstract of the paper. And I would quickly go through that abstract and that abstract will tell me that whether I am competent to review this or not. And then I must reply with all honesty to the editor that this does not fall into my expertise or this falls in my ability. So you just say yes or no based on your competence. That's one. And number two, if there is a conflict of interest because you're also working in the same area, then you should also declare it because there should not be any bias in that. That's the second. Now, there are right. three, four important points which you must have before you start reviewing it, that you must have an expertise and you must have a good analytical skill and you must have an excellent communication skill. So this is a, these are the, some very important things. When I say expertise, it's not necessarily that I am working in that particular area, but I must have the domain expertise 
so that I can connect what he's doing with what is expected to be done. And then I should be able to connect with the existing literature versus the discussion which he has made. And when I say good analytical skill, it means that I should be able to make it a point whether his discussion is relevant or not. And when I say communication skill, I think very, she very rightly said, anywhere in the world, even if it's a Nobel laureate's paper, it can be rejected. There is no paper which guarantees that this will not be rejected. And therefore, the duty of the reviewer is not only to reject, but is not only to accept, but if it is accepted, why? And if it is rejected, why? And if it is rejected, what can be the reason? What can be the reason for rejection? And how it can be the problem which you have identified can be fixed. The first read by the reviewer must tell that what are the major flaws and if there are major flaws in that, maybe plagiarism, maybe fraud, and maybe like that, I will not like to waste time into the greater analysis. And I would be very politically correct language, say, and communicative. And that's, I, I remember my first, and, and if it is a two rubbish, garbage paper, which cannot be salvaged, but even then, one reviewer can write a language which does not hurt the beginner of the research communicator. I remember I kept my first review of my first paper in 1970s. I preserved it because that said that, dear such and such, you have done this, 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 this study, and then this is, this is an excellent work. Not excellent, it's a good work. However, our, the pay, our, our journal is too heavily subscribed and we do not have any space for you. You may find it. The language which is written between the line, I think we must also learn to understand and learn to communicate. It does not, I have preserved that. How beautifully they have communicated that your paper is not worth putting this in our journal, but without hurting me. And I kept it several years that what a wonderful article I wrote, but it, there was no space in that wonderful journal, and therefore it was not published. Right, so sir. That is the so way I'm just of going to move ahead because, like I've been told, there is a shortage of time. So you've given really fantastic points, and I'm going to summarize it at the end, and you can add it there if you think anything is missing. The question for you now, because uh, you've just said that this is what you should do, is: is there a format a good reviewer follows in writing the report? Is there like a actual? a template or a format which you must follow in writing a report? Uh, you're asking me? Yes, sir. This is for okay. you. Okay. Yeah, the, I, I see there, there are two different ways. Many journals, they make a format. And these format like DBT, DST, and ICMR, they have developed a format. Many international journals also have a format asking, comment on the novelty, comment on the methodology, comment whether the discussion is appropriate, comment when the references are written properly or not, that is the format. That is one way of writing review. And the other way, they just write that they give your comments on the suitability of this publication for that. And when this is written like that, they it becomes more important how you communicate. And therefore, the must is that we must read what is the instruction from the editor that whether this they write in a specific format or they write a free flow. And I will comment on if you ask maybe uh, the supplementary question, how to respond to that. Sure, sure, we'll come to that, sir. What about you, Dr. Paula? What do you think, I mean, would you want to give a, a report in a proper format or you just want to be a narrative and give a generalized overview of how it goes? What do you think is better for the author? Uh I like in a format where the reviewer divide the report in two parts. So the general comments and the specific comments, okay? And I think it's also good to start saying, uh, starting the, with the positive parts of the study. Because, you know, the authors, they spend a lot of time conducting the study, then writing the paper. So it's good to highlight the good points, 
all papers have good points, you know. Then in the general comments, I would say about uh, if the study is clear or not, the contribution to the, to the field, the strengths, maybe some limitations, and then we go to the specific comments. So when writing the specific comments, it's very important to specify uh, exactly the point of weakness and where in the paper. It's not uncommon to receive reports where you just don't know what the reviewer is talking about. So where is this in the paper? So be very specific. Don't leave the author uh, with the question. What does this comment mean? So okay. for me, uh, I don't think it's very helpful when you get a, a comment like, I don't think you explained your method well. So what was not explained well? Tell the author, tell where it is in the paper. Uh, or methods are not consistent. What is not consistent? Again, you should try to help the author to improve the paper. Uh, or it's also very common to read the reviewer's writing. The study doesn't add to the current knowledge. So what's not adding and why? So be very specific. Then. Uh, I think when you are reviewing a paper, so you are an expert in that topic. So many times you are able to check citations and reference. I think this is important. I don't think that's the most important. I think the reviewer should focus more on the content, but sometimes we can recognize some uh, mismatches in citations and reference. Uh, I think it's also very important to carefully check figures and tables and what's written in the text. It's very common to find mismatches, and I think this is also the job of the reviewer to identify these mismatches. So this all obviously comes under the uh, same umbrella of having a format where you actually go stepwise from a general comment to more specific comments about each individual section of the manuscript. And then, of course, try to be precise and try to be more explanatory and try to give them real, uh, precise, constructive criticism that they can actually incorporate into the paper and get back to you. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. All right. All right. So just to continue on the same, uh, in the same uh, vein, for you again, Dr. Paula, what are the absolute no-nos? What are the things you will definitely not want to write in the report? Okay, so as I first said, don't be rude, okay? Uh, don't build your impression for the paper based on the author's name. So sometimes, <laughs> it's most of the times, it's blinded, but sometimes you know who the authors are. So focus the con on the content and don't write biased reports. Uh, don't write statements that you cannot substantiate. Uh, don't use the report to make self-promotion. It's also very common to see, okay, cite these and this paper so I can get more citations. So don't use the report to make self-promotion. And don't totally like or dislike a paper. I think you should have a balance. Okay, so... Presenting positive and negative points. All right. So I think what everyone is trying to say is try to be tactful. So Dr. Gupta, I mean, you're the much senior man here and you've been through a hell of a lot in life and both in... I mean, experience as well as in writing and reviewing and editing. So what extra you think are definitely knows in while at the report? I think uh, in addition to what she has said, I would say that you have to be polite, but you have to be firm. And when you see that the person is not honest, I think you have to be ruthlessly truth. When I say he is not honest, means many times. If if a a an article where there is a wrongly cited reference, when there is a cited reference which does not exist, when there is a discrepancy in the data and the 
and the plagiarism that means this author is not honest and in that is a situation politeness should be reserved and i am of that opinion he must be told his paid is paid that's one thing however when a person is honestly writing we have to be very cautious in not hurting his sentiment we have to be polite and we have to be constructive and as she rightly said usually the beginning in when you say the general and, and i used to say when there are the when there is a formatted response which the editor asks this has limited many times what to say the professorial kasari would write and say yes methodology is correct yes and is the discussion written correct yes and do you accept should we accept it no what is this so no comment should be without narration even if you are saying yes or no it must you feel so that is that is very important and sometimes when you give for preliminary review to my assistant professor associate professor that come don't give me your professorial remark yes and no please write why you say yes why you say no and then you start with a positive comment yes the in the investigator has highlighted this in this issue which is contemporary in nature has written manuscript well however the following are deficiencies which could have been corrected and then you give 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 and at the end you say perhaps perhaps this could have been written better have these references been cited and avoid citing your own references so which will in, uh, indicate the bias perhaps this statistical method would have been done so you are using word perhaps which would mean that you are giving him an option to respond so i think these are the something which are very tricky and also statistical analysis see many times my statistician my statistical wisdom and the other person statistical wisdom may be different and therefore give him a way out to explain it and also give a suggestion then this is at the best can be giving a proof of concept to study or maybe like that so we are trying to help the science to, to prevail and not to kill the science provided there is a honest science which is reflected in the paper so very well so, said by dr gupta and i totally agree with the comments by both our panelists uh, they have actually told you to be tactful but yet be polite all right sir what do you do about english language correction do you actually say okay sorry you got to revise the whole article because the english language is not good your or your brazilian language is not good <laughs> this is a very very important very very interesting question i am not a graduate not not the early convent educated person i studied in a primary school in the hindi medium gradually i acquired this skill and therefore i am a very strong proponent of that if the person is good science and honest science good data it must not be rejected just because he is not having a proper good english there are the good journals are now having a good english narrator or writer which can help them and then you can ask them politely that your language english is very bad poor or worst of the kind i have seen ever <laughs> but there is you have your english speaking friend you must be having get it checked by them and even if after that is required we have english person who can edit it who can correct it but never i will not write a comment that this is rejected because one important thing here casual mistakes repeated casual mistakes which i understand it is not that is ignorance but is a casual i have it one simple statement 
casual approach in the draft or the manuscript indicates that he is a casual worker that means he must have been casual at the bench or in the clinic or in the trial that oh. means the casually collected data must not be trusted and therefore without asking him explanation i will put this paper without telling him into my garbage box and i will tell him thank you very much wonderful paper so repeated casual mistakes is is a suicide right okay. this is a, not a, a limitation of a language but this is casual all right well, thank you thank you sir that's uh, very insightful i will go over to the other continent and uh, ask dr paula who is of course uh, i'm sure also good in english but if she has a paper and i assume it's going to be in english but if it's portuguese and it's not in good portuguese what do you do uh i'll say forget in english because i don't have papers in portuguese but okay <laughs> from my experience here yes you just published papers in english but uh sometimes it's very difficult to understand the english Okay. Sometimes I can understand what Brazilians say in English, yeah. but others can't. So I think it depends. I think uh, it's up to the editor in chief to decide. I agree. If it's good science, we should try to help the authors with language. Uh, but if it makes if it requires a lot of work that you need to totally rewrite the paper i would give the suggestion i would reject and give the option to the authors to resubmit after a language revision okay that's that's pretty precise again yes and also send the the comments of the reviewer based on the science okay so then it's up to the authors to decide what to do Okay, so since it's running short of time, this is your last question, and then there are going to be some really quick ones. Uh, what really constitutes a conflict of interest, especially when you're a reviewer? I mean, you're not really writing the article, but you're still at a conflict of interest. So when do you consider yourself at conflict of interest? You start with Paula. Mm -hmm. So I think if you are the, the mentor of the authors, or if you have very close collaboration, uh, close personal relationship with any of the authors, if you are involved in any part of the work, you are not the author, but you are involved somehow. And if you have very similar work to what you are reviewing. So if you are preparing something very similar, or if you have a work that is submitted that is very similar, I think it's a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. All right. So in such cases, what would you do, uh, Dr. Paula? Would you just sort of send it back to the editor and say, I'm sorry, but there's a conflict of interest. I can't handle this. Please send it to someone, someone else. What happens also, a second question for this is, usually sometimes you are actually suggested by some author as, your, as the reviewer. So the author says, I suggest, you know, please send mm -hmm. this paper to this person and he or she will review it either because he or she knows that person or because he or she understands or has worked on the same thing before. So two questions. What do you do with this conflict of interest? And what do you sort of do when uh, uh, you have... That being uh, as an editor-in-chief, you mean? Yeah, as an editor, as an editor-in-chief, yes. Okay, so if I recognize of, of the, any of the conflicts of interest, I acknowledge the editor, and I, then I think it's up to the editor to decide if he wants to change or not okay but i think if you you if you are still reviewing the manuscript it's very important to be uh focus on the content and forget about the authors or something else uh the other question if you are the suggested reviewer if the author has suggested you as a reviewer mm -hmm. so for me as an editor-in-chief i usually skip the suggestions Okay, okay. <laughs> because I see they are indicating friends. Yes. So I take a look at the suggesting reviewers, but most of the time I just skip those. Right. Okay, Dr. Gupta, the same two questions for you. First and foremost, what you consider as conflict of interest? It is a very, very broad subject. Conflict of interest means, if I say broadly, 
what is conflict of interest any decision or any involvement in that activity which will make the decision to be influenced by your in this context by your financial status or involvement academic or professional and vice versa say for example if there is a clinical trial where she is involved and i have a share of that particular company and you the the, the study says no this does not this anti hypertensive drug does not show any anti significant difference in blood pressure then i have a share of that company i will like to see that no 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 this is not so that is the financial and then professional maybe maybe two three type of professional which we have been struggling i am reviewing a paper of a scientist who is competing with me for a professor position <laughs> and i don't want that he should get published so i this is my conflict of interest or if i am working on the same area i have published in a area in, in a in the similar work which a different area or maybe he is supporting me or antagonizing me that is a conflict of interest and so the conflict of interest can be anything and therefore maybe the same institution or maybe the friend or maybe the enemy maybe the professional enemy so these are the conflict of interest and this must be declared in the beginning conflict of interest does not mean that i will not be able to review it but if the conflict of interest is declared accurately correctly this will depend on the editor how to filter and how to take the cognizance of the comments which you have made so that there is no component of bias in the decision making process so, so conflict of interest does not mean that i cannot take part conflict of interest means if you declare accurately it is up to editor whether you should be the accused or whether and how to take this that's it so fantastic answers by both the panelists and uh, i think you've got a perspective both of a you know very experienced and a person who's trying to learn out how and how to make sure there's more articles published okay so quick questions and we we'll start with dr gupta uh, i'm going to read the whole question because it's a long one but i want an answer in just two lines you do not consider an article worthy of publishing do you mention this to the author directly in your review or do you inform the editor and leave it for him or her to do that i i would say if the if the article is exciting and must be come must be known to the community to the scientific community i will strongly recommend the editor that it should be published if the article is fraud does not have anything and if i think that the editor should take a negative decision i must communicate him confidentially there are always a method of writing direct directly to the editor without communicating to the author so i yeah. would be doing both okay all right dr paula what would you do okay i would also inform the editor uh, but i would do the review so we can have arguments to reject the paper so at the end of the end the, of the, the review that it's not worthy of publishing so at the end of the review would you write down i'm sorry but your article is uh, sort of not considered no i think that's the job of the the editor okay fantastic so second question again this time for you is it really acceptable to quote any review or meta analysis that proves or disproves the results in a manuscript that have been missed out by the author is it a good practice is it a good idea is it acceptable at all i think it is acceptable uh if it's not self promotion as i mentioned before yes yes uh but it can happen that you just miss the paper and that's a paper that that has to be said that's going to help with this study so i think it's acceptable mm -hmm. okay okay so last question for dr gupta so there are major discrepancies in the methodology and results and they don't code sort of correlate how do you communicate this to the author i mean are you like blunt about it or are you like you said firm but polite no i i i would say i would be firm if there is a major discrepancies and i will not bother in this case 
when there is a major discrepancy in the results i say discrepancy i will not be bother about politeness all right okay thank you that's very really good just to summarize we've gone through the components we've heard that the components we have to be fair we have to be honest unbiased constructive thorough and based on evidence uh dr paula said that before she started accepting just study whether you fit into your it fits into the field of your expertise and whether you have the time and that's something that's really really important because we had a little session earlier about time and people said that you could do this review in sometimes in a in an hour or sometimes in two hours and some people said days so i think you'll have to justify what exactly you mean by time there and what is the adequate time for you to give a proper fair unbiased constructive thorough evidence based review report and of course you should be in a good mood and uh, dr gupta said that uh, look at the abstract first and you will know whether you are competent enough to answer this so i think we can take those uh, points back from there be gentle be polite both of them said that again and again and again but be open to ideas how about the format the format should be summarized in the beginning as a general Uh, overview of what you think about the paper but then it has to be very specific provide perspective talk about where the revisions are required you have to have to sort of specify exactly what doesn't sort of fit what isn't right what can be improved upon what needs major rehauling or what needs uh, some minor correction and also again be precise about what you want from them don't be very general as dr paula stated and of course uh dr gupta said that you can have a con- sort of a format which talks about only novelty of the article or whether it is uh, logical to have that article or the suitability of the article and you must see your journal and decide that what are the absolute no nos you heard dr fellings in the morning uh, sorry a little earlier in the evening talk about the calm approach i think that's a fantastic approach so try to understand exactly what's happening answer very gently and lightly list exactly what's wrong list it please don't don't jump into just outrightly saying no list your problem and be mindful because that person out there who spent maybe days and months to get that research out may not have actually made the mistake by you know purpose by purpose but might be having a small error maybe it's a small plagiarism error or something else as far as the english language is concerned both the authors stated that they all come from backgrounds where english was not their primary language and they said do not reject a paper purely because of an english language recommend that if it's really really worth publishing to the editor and uh, sort of suggest to the authors to sort of improve their english by either referring them to their friends or going through that again and when you have conflict of interest i think the best is to go back and uh, inform your editor of the same and if not then refer to an alternate reviewer so this is basically in brief what we need to understand there are reporting guidelines and we can follow the reporting guidelines i think we've wrapped it up in 30 minutes so thank you dr gupta thank you dr paula if there are any questions for the panelists i don't see any coming in the chat box but if there are please go ahead and and I'll over back to you gayatri thank you dr thank you very much dr chukral thank you very much dr chukral wonderful sir thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you dr thank you gayatri thank, thank you. you paula bye bye it's really good to have you here sir thank you it was a wonderful session so other after this session like uh, in the last uh, 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 session we were having very interactive activity we uh, have given some questions quiz to the participants and we got the overwhelming response on that that is taken care by dr pooja now uh, this um, for this session also dr vandana has given uh, one paper to the participant to review that and we have got very good response and i think dr vanna can tell what was the response what was the statistics what people were writing over to you dr vanna thank you so much gayatri this is the coming to the end of the two day session that we've been holding and after so much of talk and so much of good information by such experts uh, let's review the hands on activity that was done so like i'll just share my screen quickly uh one second hmm so we distributed a manuscript and um the manuscript was about 
I just a second, I'll just start reviewing. Uh -oh. Give me a second, I'm not able to share my screen. So before I start talking about the activity, I'll just also go over the questions that were asked by the audience. There was one question by um, an audience member who said that if the reviewer gives some comments and you're running out of word limits, uh, what should you do? And the panelists responded to that saying that answering back to the reviewer is more important than uh, restricting yourself to the word limit. Talk to the editor about it. And um, the next question was about how to not agree with the comments provided by the reviewer. And I think we've we've listened to many comments about it saying that yes, we can not agree to the reviewer comments, but be polite throughout and uh, give a soft rebuttal. Then there was one more question about so what are the guidelines for narrative review? And one of the panelists, Dr. Patra Lake, actually pointed out there are guidelines apart from Prisma, uh, which is for the systematic reviews. There are guidelines, um, which are called, I think, this SANRA, the Sandra guidelines, which are available for reviewing narrative reviews. So that was good information that was provided. Um, So we had distributed an article earlier. It is already a pre-approved article, but we decided uh, to share it with the people who are interested in doing this activity. And uh, people were asked to give their comments in a particular format. Uh, Dr. Gayatri, I'm having a problem with sharing my screen. Yeah, Maybe I think it's coming. Sure. It's coming. Yeah, we can see your desktop. Can you see the... Yeah, it's coming slowly. Yeah, it's coming. Now we can see it. So it's a title okay. page. Mm -hmm. So the article, as I said, was about uh, measuring hallux valgus, and the manuscript described a new method for measuring it using standard AP radiographs. The study presented reliability statistics and the measurements uh, differences based on a group of healthy subjects and patients with HV. Um, the manuscript was easy to read, and there were some details required in the methods section to improve the understandability of the manuscript. So what we have done right now is we have reviewed all the 25 or more uh, reports that we have received from various people and have compiled them together. This is kind of a summary statement that I'm providing for uh, the manuscript that we received. It was usually considered to be well-written and the methodology was clear. So, Despite that, I saw many comments coming in, which were about language. And I think after two days of discussions, I think we are uh, okay to say that let's refrain from commenting about grammar, language, line spacing, typographical errors, and don't restrict your review just to those things. Please comment on the science, um, unless and until it's something like incomprehensible, I wouldn't go towards commenting about the English language in such details. Uh, you may just mention it in a line if you need to. So don't do that, refrain from commenting on all of these things. The, um, Dr. Gajay, are you able to see the slides moving? Yes, yes, yeah, we are able to see. The strength of the article was it was easy to read. The tables and figures were well. The critique of the article was that uh, the gap in the literature was not well established. So one of the lines from the article was, that the previous literature, and I'm quoting it, the comparative inter-observer and the intra-observer reliability of these measurements can be variable. And it was very loosely worded. So the earlier studies had a problem. There was a limitation that they had very variable reliability, but variable is a very loose term. And uh, many of the reviewers pointed out that the authors should provide more details as to what exactly was the limitation of the previous studies. So the gap was not well established. The next critique which came about was that reliability is a component of validity and uh, the accuracy or the validity was not established. So the authors went about talking about a new method 
for measuring hallux valgus, but there was no comparisons with any gold standard. There was no data about sensitivity and specificity. And I would let Dr. Gayatri comment if the validity is not there, would reliability data be uh, good to publish or should the authors have also provided any validity data before providing any reliability data? Yeah, exactly. If the study is not valid, you know, it's like it should not get published. So this is a just we should have had more data to substantiate accuracy yeah. before going for inter observer and intra observer reliability. So that was a very good comment that came from uh, some of the reviewers. Then there were some uh, details which were missing and I'll just quickly go over those. I think the this, this study did not tell details about how the subjects were included or how was the severity of the condition decided. Uh, there were some errors in reporting. So if you can see the slide and the picture right now on the screen, um, they mentioned that you have to draw these two lines and they said that the distance between line A and B was some measure. Those two are intersecting lines. There's no distance between them. So there are some basic, very simple mistakes also in the methodology that was explained. Then um, there was some repetition between graphs and text between methods and results, because I think the sample were described in the methods before they were described in the results. Um, a big problem was that ICC was not reported with any confidence intervals. Dr. Gayatri, is it very mandatory to report confidence intervals for any measure that we be it differences, be it ICCs? Um, is it a, just a good practice or is it mandatory almost? So it, it should be mandatory, you know, you can get because this is whatever research we are doing, it is just for on one sample. If you're giving the confidence interval, we are, you know, uh, drawing some inference that it could be in between this. So it should be mandatory, I think. Right. So we had that information missing. So that was something I think that was kind of a major thing that was missing. Um, and the last point, which was, I think, kind of uh, again, very common thing that we see that the conclusion tend to go beyond the scope of the study. And so was in this study, the conclusions were beyond the scope. It, they were doing some measurements and based on the measurements, the authors suggested some surgeries. Now, very frankly, it's a new measurement. We don't know whether it is valid. And uh, the basis of this could not be what surgical decisions that do they make. So of course, the conclusions went beyond the scope and I think the authors should have been asked to rewrite the conclusion to not include those statements. But more or less the study was otherwise well written. This is what the crux of uh, the results that we thought. Uh, the content definitely matched the journal. Uh, it provided some novel results. The data supported the conclusions, uh, but the writing may or may not have been uh, up to the mark. Many people thought that they could have been improved. And based on what results we got, in fact, uh, we're deciding on winners. And in fact, there's some amazing reviews we got. And I would like to right now applaud uh, the works from Dr. Utkarsh Bhagat, Dr. Anil Agrawal, and Mayan Garg for providing very good reviews. And I hope this hands-on activity was helpful for others as well in uh, learning how to review an article. Sometimes it was out of the scope of their works, but they went out of the way and activity and I'm so thankful for all the participants for responding back. Um, thank you so much and congratulations to all three of you for having done such a wonderful job for review. Yeah, and this brings us to the end of the session for today. One, one, and I make one, one comment here, one question rather. Yes, Dr. Tutral. Did you actually study how long it took them to sort of get a good review? Because this is what you've been discussing since morning. Since the right, evening, right, right. So. I agree. Uh, there was no question on how much time was spent. I agree that would have been a good question to add. Yes, okay. we could have asked okay. that, yep. We did not get an average time of how much time they spend on reviewing. Okay, so I'll um, be back with Dr. Gayatri to wrap up the session. Uh, Dr. Chabra is also here. So thank you so much for all the participation. Thank you, Dr. Vanna. It was very, uh, very good activity, you know, where after listening so many things, like different aspects of, um, uh, like how, what are the process of reviewing and uh, what are the things which a reviewer should take care of after that, uh, doing this activity, they really got the hands on on this. So really very good activity. So before summing up, I'll ask um, 
Dr. Shavra, if you want to say something. I think uh, it has been a wonderful two sessions where all of us have uh, enjoyed a lot. Uh, this uh, uh, session today was, uh, uh, again, um, added a lot to our knowledge and exp uh, experience, and we gained a lot from the experience of stalwarts. Um, I'm sure uh, we'll be able to carry on uh, further such activities uh, over the remaining part of the year and the other committees of uh, the journal will also uh, look into organizing such activities. I would fail in my duties if I do not thank all the participants for joining us for the two sessions and the faculty, the panelists and the moderators uh, from whom we benefited a lot. I would also want to thank the um, all those uh, who uh, contributed to the organization of the committee, the progression committee per se, uh, the uh, Dr. Gayatri, Dr. Vandana, Dr. Pooja, and the IT team of ISIC, and all those who have uh, worked beyond behind the scenes to make these two events a success. Of course, we would also want to thank Ortho TV for letting us uh, have uh, use their platform uh, for these uh, two events. And of course, uh, JCOT is the official publication of uh, Delhi Orthopedic Association. And I would want to thank Delhi Orthopedic Association and especially Dr. Atul Vaish, Dr. Shekhar Shivastav and the entire executive and members of DOA. Um, I'm sure we will come up with better activities and uh, we will strengthen the journal further. So um, with these words, I would hand it back to Gayatri. Gayatri, Thank I you, believe sir. you have remaining agenda left with the president DOA also waiting. Mm. Yeah. So uh, before summing up this and, and this program, two-day program, I'll request Dr. Atul Vesh to say a few words for the validatory. And... Thanks, Dr. Gayatri. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Uh, it was really grateful and uh, DOA is grateful to Dr. Chabra and his team for organizing this two days uh, webinar. It was really informative. Like I learned a lot and especially for the budding reviewers, this must be uh, very uh, useful. And few of our DOA members have recently joined and they are uh, still have to learn all the river activities and all. And these two day seminar must have helped them a lot. And uh, Dr. Chhabra sir has already given the vote of thanks, but on behalf of DOA, I would also like to thank all the keynote speakers, our moderators and our panelists uh, who have shared their knowledge, spared their time with us and really an educative activity DOA can think of. Uh, so really thankful, Dr. H. S. Chavra, sir, for your efforts and all the team you have. They have wonderfully done, Dr. Gayatri, especially Dr. Pooja and uh, Dr. Vandana. So it's from my heart that I want to thank each and every member of your team for organizing this beautiful webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words. And thank you, Dr. Chhabra, for giving us this opportunity. This is uh, really good learning for us, organizing and interacting with such a stalwarts here. We have like a really very good team. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And, and we are expecting that we'll deliver more such kind of events in future. Yes. And we'll be associated with JCOT. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to the next event. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Sure. Thank you.